All right, here we go. Hello, hello, hello. Test one, two, three. I am John Beckman, Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman, the father of sin, the transgenic mother of sin, your hostess with the mostest. Okay, let's do a lecture on sterile insect technique. The first thing to understand about sterile insect technique is the historical first usage, which was on screwworm. Here's screwworm. Here's a nasty infestation of screwworm on a cow. To put it plainly, a full-blown screwworm infestation is a death sentence for the host animal. Okay, so this situation is called myiasis. Myiasis is infestation with fly larvae. Okay, so here's the screwworm larvae. And there's different forms of myiasis. There's what's called primary myiasis and secondary myiasis. Okay. Secondary myiasis is when flies, fly larvae, many flies can do this. Fly larvae come to a, a wound that's already there, an open wound on the animal, and they lay their eggs, and, and then the eggs hatch into larvae, and the larvae infest that wound that was already there. That's secondary myiasis. So secondary myiasis requires that a wound is already there. Primary myiasis is different from secondary myiasis because primary myiasis it means that the flies that can do primary myiasis cause the wound, okay? So screwworm is particularly bad because it is an inducer of primary myiasis. It's the first cause. The fly can lay its larvae, uh, lay its eggs on the host, they hatch, and then the larvae cause the first instance of myiasis, okay? So that's an important thing to know, primary versus secondary myiasis. Okay, we used to have bad screwworm in the United States until it was gotten rid of by the sterile insect technique. Okay, so when you see SIT, that means sterile insect technique. Okay, and this is one thing that entomologists are so proud of we are famous for because we have successfully eradicated screwworm from North America using the sterile insect technique. So the premise of sterile insect technique is very simple, okay? You develop a factory and the job of that factory is to grow sterile males. So let's color code sterile males with these black dots. And let's have wild type males be red dots. And let's have wild type females be green axis. So the premise of sterile insect technique is you grow a bunch, millions, millions per week of sterile males, okay? And you release them into the popu well, population at overwhelming numbers. And if you release sterile males at overwhelming populations into the population, when the females mate, okay, just based on probability, and numbers, they are more likely to choose mates that are sterile because you've released so many of them. And then when these matings happen, the females lay eggs that die, okay? So what this does is if you graph what happens when you're doing sterile insect technique, y-axis is number of individuals of the pests that you're targeting, y-axis is time, Sterile insect technique produces graphs that look like this, where it's able to reduce and eradicate locally populations of pests. That is the basic premise of sterile insect technique. Okay. And there are four basic things that you need for the sterile insect technique. There's actually a few more. We'll list them all. Okay. First thing is you need a means of mass rearing. That's what I'm talking about, like the factory. You literally need like an actual factory whose entire job is to grow insects. You need a means of sex exclusion. So in many cases where they're doing sterile insect technique, actually, this was not the case for screwworm. I think when they did screwworm, they didn't care. But in more modern 
examples of sterile insect technique, you need sex exclusion. So for example, if you're doing sterile insect technique with mosquitoes, you don't want to be releasing female mosquitoes because they bite people. So you have to have a means of just separating out the males. So you need a means of sex separation. You need a means of sterilization. You have to be able to sterilize those males. Okay. And the caveat here that is a subject area of a lot of research is how do you sterilize? It has to be a sterilization that does not reduce fitness. It has to be no reduction in fitness if you want the sterile insect technique to work. And the reason that you need this is because if you just produce a bunch of sterile males and they're completely unfit and you release them into the wild population, the females will not mate with those males because they're not fit. Okay, so it will only work if you can sterilize them sort of without the females knowing. You can't reduce their fitness. The fourth thing you need is a means of distribution. You need a means through which you can distribute all these insects that you're growing over vast geographical areas, unless you're doing sterile insect technique in a very small area. But either way, regardless, you need a means to distribute those insects. Okay, so as I go through the examples of sterile insect technique, I kind of want to define and give examples of how each of these criteria are met for the usage cases. All right, here is Edward Nippling. He invented the sterile insect technique, okay, for the screwworm pest. And this was originally a collaboration with USDA and the US military. And the way that it worked is they would rear screwworms, okay? So here's some pictures of them rearing screwworms in a giant screwworm facility. And they would go into these basements in Texas. Literally, it was like a basement at a military base. And they set up like a tub. And in that tub, they had radioactive cobalt. Okay? So they had a source of irradiation and they would essentially just take a little container. They would collect the pupae of the screwworms and they would dump it and just drop the pupae through the container. And as the pupae fell through the container, they would get just enough dose of radioactive cobalt that it would sterilize them. Okay. And then they would just take all the pupae. So they actually did not do sex sorting in the original sterile insect technique. They would take all the pupae. They would load them up on an airplane and they would fly this airplane and drop the drop the pupae. Okay. Then the pupae would hatch out as a sterile adults. They would mate. And it worked. One reason that this works so well, which helps, which helps sterile insect technique work well, is this sort of like point five, is if you have monogamous insects where they mate once. If they only mate once. That helps you out a lot. If there's an insect where there's sort of like sex competition or sperm competition and they collect multiple sperms, sterile insect technique is not going to work very well. So another thing that helped out in the original usage case is that the screwworms only mate once. It'll help you out even more if the females only mate once, but the males mate multiple times. You see how that would compound your utility of the sterile insect technique if you have sterile males that mate a whole bunch of times, but females only mate once. So the first place that they ever did this was this lovely place called Curacao. Curacao is a small island just north of Venezuela. Okay, And this was the first place where they demonstrated that sterile insect technique could work and eradicate screwworm. So they first tested it on an island, which is a smart thing to do, okay? It's like the Jurassic Park scenario where if you want to try something new that you've never tried before and you hope it works well, but you're worried that it might not work well, you try it on an island, okay? So they tried it on Kirkau and it worked well. Once it worked in Kirkau, then the USDA decided to do it in North America. And so they started at the tip of Florida. So if here's the southern United States, here's Texas, here's Florida. They started releasing screwworms, sterile screwworms, southern Florida, and moved northward like this. And they pushed the screwworm 
all the way down through Texas. All the way down through Mexico, through Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. Okay. And in Panama, there's a very thin area of land. And now the screwworm is held at bay. It's still present in South America, but the screwworm is held at bay from invading North America in Panama. And here's a picture of the actual facility in Panama where they rear these screwworms to this day and release them to this day. And it's still funded by the USDA. One of our great success stories. Okay. Another thing to say about the sterile insect technique is outbreaks of screwworm have periodically happened throughout history. And there are there's a case in Libya, in North Africa, where there was an outbreak of screwworm and they used the techniques learned by the USDA and the United States military and did the sterile insect technique in North Africa and Libya, and they were able to eliminate that outbreak of screwworm. So there are multiple replicates, not just one. There are multiple replicates where entomologists have eradicated screwworm using the sterile insect technique. All right, there are multiple ways to do the sterile insect technique, and it's different for different insects. And this has been applied to multiple insects, okay? This has been also applied to mosquitoes. And this has also been applied to tephridids. Here's the tephridids, the other more pretty fruit flies, often pests of fruit. <clears throat> But here's the trick. The, for each insect, the implementation of sterile insect techniques is a little bit different, and there's different mechanisms. So in the case of screwworm, the mechanism of sterilization was radioactive cobalt. In the case of mosquitoes, the mechanism of sterilization, there's actually a few. There are some GMO genetically modified organisms where they induce steril sterility via a genetic modification. There are also symbionts like Wolbachia that can induce sterility. And so there are sterile insect techniques that utilize natural, naturally occurring Wolbachia symbionts to induce sterility. And in the case of tephridids, oftentimes they're using gamma irradiation. Gamma irradiation is the process or the result of radioactive cobalt. So cobalt-60 produces gamma irradiation, which irradiates. <laughs> and if you're wondering what gamma irradiation is, it results from the degradation of radioactive cobalt-60, which releases photons. Okay, let's dive into the GMOs. So GMO SIT, there's a few different versions of this. One version in mosquitoes is called RIDDLE. RIDDLE stands for release of insects with a dominant lethal. Okay, a dominant lethal. What's a dominant lethal? This is a gene. When I draw an arrow like that, that's a, that's representation. Represent that's a representation of a gene on DNA, which codes for a protein. A dominant lethal gene, a DL, is a gene that if you only have one copy of it, it'll kill you. If it turns on, it'll kill you. Okay, so that's what a dominant lethal is. So know what a dominant lethal is. A copy of a gene. If you have only have one copy, it'll kill you. So what they do in Riddle is they have a special promoter. If you're wondering what a promoter is, it's like the light switch of a gene, okay? It controls whether the gene is on or off, okay? And they use what's called the TET off, the TET off promoter, okay? That means in the presence of a chemical 
an antibiotic called tetracycline. In the presence of tetracycline, the gene is off. So you add tetracycline, shuts the gene off. Okay. If you remove tetracycline, minus tet, the gene turns on. Okay. And so if this is a dominant lethal transgene, so a gene that you inserted into a mosquito, it's a dominant lethal, you can hold the gene off by growing the mosquitoes in tubs of water. that have tetracycline. You put tetracycline in the water, it'll keep that dominant lethal gene off. The mosquitoes will survive. You grow a whole bunch of them, you sex separate them, take the males, release the males. Now here's what happens. You have a male that has that dominant lethal transgene and that male mates with the female. They do a cross and they generate offspring the offspring are going to inherit that dominant lethal if it's homozygous. So if it's homozygous in the male, there's two copies of it. The offspring are going to inherit that dominant lethal. And these are going to be offspring out in the wild that are in the ponds in your backyards. And so there's no tetracycline in the water outside in the ponds. So now all of a sudden the gene turns on. Okay. So the dominant lethal gene now turns on and it will immediately kill those larvae. Okay, and there are a few iterations of this. There's a few been a few subsequent upgrades and new technological upgrades, but this is the basic gist. Okay, so here's what you need to know about Riddle: it's release of insects with a dominant lethal. A dominant lethal is a gene that if you only have one copy, it'll kill you. They hold the gene off by growing the mosquitoes in water with tetracycline, and then when they release the mosquitoes, those mosquitoes mate. They pass on that gene and all the offspring die because they grow up in water that does not have tetracycline. And then the gene turns on and kills the mosquitoes. Okay. There's a lot of more complex underlying like genetic engineering underneath this that I don't want to talk about. But if you're interested, you can take my biotechnology class. Okay. So just understand that. The thing about Riddle is I do kind of, I usually ask this on test questions is I say, is Riddle sterile insect technique? And it's kind of a funny question. It kind of is sterile insect technique, but also kind of not. It's sterile insect technique in that you release males and the production or the, the outcome of that release is that the, uh, the population goes down. Essentially, it kills the population. But it's not sterile insect technique semantically in a sense of it's not actually sterility of sperm. Okay, it's not sterility of sperm that's happening. It's the inheritance of a controlled dominant lethal genetic transgene. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Uh, that is one mechanism of GMO sterility. Another one of these methods is called PGSIT. This stands for Precision Guided Sterile Insect Technique. This is one of the newest developments in insect genetic technologies. Okay. So precision guided sterile insect technique relies on the CRISPR Cas9 system. So I will briefly just briefly overview this. Cas9 is essentially an enzyme that is essentially a scissors. Okay. And what Cas9 cuts is DNA molecules. Okay. And you can tell the Cas9 enzyme precisely where to cut on the DNA by adding what's called guide RNA. Okay. So the scissors, snip, snip, can be guided to a very specific site on the DNA by the guide RNA, and then it cuts. Okay. And when it cuts, it induces what's called a DSB or a double stranded break, which is a break, clean break in the DNA. Okay. And when you induce breaks in the DNA, if you do it in the right spot, you can cause certain phenotypes. You can cause problems. And so if you target important genes, you can pre you can create sterility 
by inducing double-stranded breaks in specific spots on the DNA. You can also kill insects in a sex-specific manner using this technology. So you can get special guide RNAs that if you put that guide RNA in complex with that Cas9 scissors, it'll only kill females. And so the advantage of precision-guided SIT is that you can do two things at the same time. You can sex sort if you add the right guide to RNA, and you can also simultaneously sterilize. Okay. So the advantage of precision guided sterile insect technique is you can kind of do two things at the same time. You can sex sort because you just kill females using a special snip snip. And you can also sterilize at the same time using a special snip snip. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because, but, but because this is not a, again, it's not a biotechnology class, so I don't want to go too much into the molecular details, but this is a broad overview of what's actually happening at the genetic level, okay? So these are two separate systems for genetically modified insects that are used for sterile insect technique. Riddle, release of insects with a dominant lethal, and PGSIT, which is precision guided sterile insect technique. Okay. Now let's look back up here. One of the other ways to sterilize were symbionts. So there is a concept called the microbiome. The microbiome is this idea that an organism is made of much more than just the cells of that organism. An organism is also a plethora of microorganisms that live in association with that organism. You have a bunch of microbes in your gut that are actually a part of you. They are a part of your body. And I think it's actually true that humans actually have more symbiotic cells. So like more cells of bacteria that are living amongst them than cells in their body. Fact check me on that. Might be true. That's what I hear in the microbiome stuff. Okay. Anyway, the point is, there are microbes that live in association with other organisms. One of these microbes is special. It's called Wolbachia. Wolbachia is a symbiont of insects. It lives inside of insects, and it lives in a special spot. It lives in their testes and their ovaries, and guess what it has the power to do? It has the power to sterilize their sperm. This is actually what I study. I'm not going to go into the details of how it does that. That's but that's what I study. If you're interested, take the biotechnology class. Okay, but essentially understand that in mosquitoes, in their sperm, there is this symbiotic bacteria and it has the power to sterilize their sperm cells, okay? And so what happens in sterile insect technique using the Wolbachia is you can take mosquitoes. So here's a mosquito called Aedes. Um, they do this with Aedes albopictus. They take a certain strain of Wolbachia and they infect the testes with those Wolbachia. That causes a sterility in the sperm. And then they can release those insects into the wild using them for the sterile insect technique. Now I skipped like a lot of details there, but again, like we're doing a broad overview. What you need to know is that Wolbachia, a symbiont that lives inside of insects can be used to cause sterility without reducing the fitness of the mosquito. And then you can release those insects to do the sterile insect technique. All right, so in review, we've discussed multiple mechanisms of sterilization. We discussed cobalt-60 gamma rays. We discussed PGSIT, which is a genetically modified organism. We discussed Riddle, which is a genetically modified organism. And we discussed Wolbachia. These are four different mechanisms through which you can induce sterility in insects for the sterile insect technique.
All right, let's now talk about sex exclusion methodologies. So in many systems where they're implementing sterile insect technique, sex exclusion can be a necessary part of that process. And there are multiple ways to get sex exclusion. So the most easy way, the best way, the most simple way, the cheapest way is you hope for sexual dimorphism. So if males physically and morphologically appear different from females, then you can pretty clearly and qu sometimes easily sex sort them. That is the case for mosquitoes. So in mosquitoes, the pupae, they kind of look like commas with eyeballs like this. Okay. And in mosquitoes, the female pupae are fatter and the male pupae are thinner. There's actually a clear, distinct size discrepancy between male and female pupae. It's very consistent. And so what they do is they take two glass plates and they put the glass plates together like this, where one side is tight and the other side is open. Okay. And they take tubs of water that are growing the mosquitoes and they pour the pupae through the plates and the males, the thickness is set perfectly so that the males pass through, the male pupae pass through, but the fat females, they get stuck in between the glass plates. Okay. And so this is a very, very efficient, fast way to get something akin to 99.9% .9 sex separation in mosquitoes. We also talked about the precision guided sterile insect technique. The way that you can get sex separation with precision guided sterile insect technique is you take that Cas9 enzyme, snip, snip, and you, com you combine it with a special guide RNA that targets a special gene that might only kill females. So if you think about how this mechanistically now, if we go into the details of how this might work, in insects, you have some various chromosomes Depending on the sex system, there might be an XY combination perhaps that produces males, and there might be an XX combination that produces females. I'm not saying specifically for the mosquito that this is the case. I'm saying you find chromosomal differences between males and females, okay? And if you can find a specific chromosomal gene that's essential, but it's only essential for one sex. And so it's probably near or on a sex chromosome or at a sex chromosome site. You can target that with the guide RNA. You cut that gene with the guide RNA. That will cause death of a specific sex of mosquito, okay? Or insect. And I do think this is gonna get more popular. This is gonna get more popular because I think it's gonna work very, very well to do sex separation very quickly. So it's essentially a methodology of you just kill the other sex using a genetic mechanism. You can also use behavioral Behavioral ways to sex separate. Okay, so in mosquitoes, for example, my expertise is in mosquitoes, so you hear a lot about mosquitoes. In mosquitoes, males are attracted to the wing beat frequency of the females because they want to mate. So they have a mechanism through which they can hear the wing beat frequency, and you can set up, you can set up. I wouldn't call it a maze, but you could set up like choices where they either go left or right. And on one side, you put the sound that they're attracted to. And on the other side, you don't have the sound and they will be attracted to that sound. OK, and you can do series of con series of compounded decision making where they keep moving towards that sound. And over a while, you can use this to perfect your sex separations. You can actually behaviorally sex separate certain insects. 
and mosquitoes are one example of that. Okay, so those are the mechanisms of sex separation. We talked about sexual dimorphism. We talked about precision guided sterile insect technique, and we talked about behavioral. All right. Now let's talk about this other one, means of distribution. Okay, this can be tricky. The means of distribution can be tricky and there's multiple mechanisms that people do this. In one implementation of sterile insect technique with Wolbachia in mosquitoes, they literally have a van Okay. Many of the worst mosquito populations are in urban centers. So in urban cities where you are at risk of vector-borne diseases. And so they load the mosquitoes up into this van and the van is a robot that has sort of like barrels shooting out of the van doors. And as the van drives through different neighborhoods, a computer program will spit out males, sterile males, as the van drives through different neighborhoods, okay? So you can use a van, a van robot. Live in a van down by the river. Okay, um, an airplane was the classical example of the screw worm where they would load the pupae into the airplane. They would fly the airplane and they would just drop the pupae and the pupae just float down close into adults and still insect technique just magically happens. So airplanes, vans, and there's also other methodologies where the humans are actually releasing them. So humans are taking cages, bringing them to different neighborhoods and releasing them. So the means of distribution are such. Okay, so at a 10,000 foot overview level, that is pretty much everything you need to know about sterile insect technique. It's a very useful skill. It works very well. Governments use it all throughout the world, and it's becoming more and more and more popular, especially for pest insects and for mosquitoes in particular. So you're going to see more of this in the future, I suspect. Have a good day.